it's uh, exactly four o'clock on my clock. So um, thank you all for being here so timely. And uh, it's my pleasure today in our uh, Equip webinar series to introduce uh, the speaker. And uh, his name is Martin Michel. Uh, as you can see, he works at the Department of Pharmacology at the uh, University in Mainz in Germany. And um, he's been a very avid contributor to uh, Equipped uh, to the consortium um, and to the framework as well. We've had uh, a lot of discussions on statistics and uh, also hypothesis testing and hypothesis generating research. Uh, he also taught in uh, all three the um, editions of the Equipped Summer School on statistics and uh, has been known to make the subject uh, really entertaining. Uh, if some of you still think that statistics is uh, quite daunting or, uh, or a bit boring even, oh no. Uh, so I hope that you will enjoy his lecture uh, today. Uh, Martin, if you'd like to introduce yourself further, that's, uh, um, that's excellent, of course. I hope you have given you enough uh, credit like this. Uh, the yeah. floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, I should say that I'm a physician by training who has specialized in research for more than 30 years. And most of my knowledge on statistics is self-taught. Um, I happen to have as one of my postdoctoral mentors, the author um, of a statistics textbook, and um, I learned a lot from him, of course. So today the topic is A Hitchhiker's Guide to Statistics. It's now generally recognized that inappropriate use and interpretation of statistical tests is one of the key causes of poor reproducibility. And that happens at multiple levels. Generally, a poor understanding of the fundamental concepts of statistics, a wrong interpretation of p-values, the concept of the false discovery rate, or FDR, and the concept of p-hacking. By way of introduction, I want to show you an example. Generally, you know that an effect can be observed based on chance alone, even if nothing is there. For instance, if you draw five cards from a deck, sometimes four of them are aces. Of course, it's rare, but it happens sometimes. Consider yourself lucky if you like to play poker. The same thing happens in science as well. And I want to give you an example of one of my statistic courses. We let the participants pick two groups of 10 random numbers each from a database of real data, in this case, from a clinical study. And as you can see here, um, the mean value of this NS10 for each participant exhibited a lot of variability in group A, but also in group B, and which looked like considerable differences between the first and the second group across the two pick groups. And you see this ranges here, ranging from a difference of four in one direction to five in the other direction. Now that's kind of interesting because these data are, as I said, real data, real people. And in that disease, the difference between best available treatment and placebo is one unit on this scale. So many, many participants got effects bigger than what is the difference here between best available treatment and placebo. So of relevant clinical magnitude, in some cases, even with p-values as low as 0 0.0002. Nonetheless, as all of them came from the same population, by definition, in this very specific case, the null hypothesis is true, which means all of these observed differences are false positives. None of them is real, just based on chance alone. Which brings me to the question which I see from a lot of courses I'm teaching, many people don't fully understand. A p-value tells us the probability, and the p in p-value stands for probability, 
that a given effect or larger would have been observed by chance alone if the samples had been selected randomly from populations with the same mean or median. And that's called the randomness assumption. And that's the basic of all statistic tests under the sun. So what does that mean? The random here has clear implications. It means that a calculated p-value is only meaningful if all factors other than the primary independent variable, that's what discriminates your groups, are randomly distributed among groups. If your study has any type of bias, the samples by default are non-random samples. And you heard in other parts of this webinar series that our key defenses against biases are pre-specification, randomization, and blinding. Moreover, p-values cannot be interpreted at face value if there are investigator-induced violations of randomness, such as p-hacking, and I'll come to that. In other words, p-values are only meaningful if biases have been ex excluded or at least markedly reduced. And that means any statistical value you calculate without having first markedly reduced biases is not very meaningful. And that's such a fundamental concept that I'll, I'll try to repeat that in other wordings. If there is any violation of the randomness assumption, calculated p-values become difficult to interpret, it, perhaps even invalid and misleading. Those violations, the biases, can occur unconsciously, which is most of the, the case, or they can be investigator-induced. Unconscious biases can occur at any level of a study, in the design phase, the conduct phase, the data analysis, and the data reporting. And the bad thing is all of them add up. Investigator-induced violations of randomness are summarized under the term p-hacking, and I'll come back to that later in the presentation. In other words, p-values aren't trophies. Of course, the asterisk above the data point looks nice and maybe necessary to get a paper accepted, particularly if you face reviewers who have a p-value addiction. However, any of those asterisks resulting from p-hacking makes your data less meaningful, possibly even invalid. In the words of David Kalkoon, already stated in an article 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, the function of significance tests is to prevent you from making a fool of yourself and not to make unpublishable results publishable. So once we understand what p-values we, we are, we can talk about um, what really is this statistical hypothesis testing? Generally, statistics report on the probability that an effect or, or larger would have been observed based on chance alone. And this statistical hypothesis testing turns a spectrum of probabilities into a crisp binary decision. You reject or you accept the pre-specified null hypothesis. The problem is reality is more complex most of the time. The other big problem is, as I already said, and I must repeat myself because it's of such fundamental importance, it's only meaningful if major attempts have been made to reduce biases. That is, that all major aspects of the protocol, including sample size and statistical strategy, have been pre-specified. When these conditions are met, statistical tests can enable decision-making. For instance, the EMA or the FDA or any other regulatory agency typically ask 
that the p-value is less than 0.05 for the primary endpoint in a phase three study required for regulatory approval. I always like relating things to, let's say the real world. The null hypothesis of a scientist is comparable to the presumed innocent of a judge or juror in a criminal court trial. Neither can conclude that the defendant is innocent or that the null hypothesis is true. You can only conclude whether someone is guilty, that is the null hypothesis gets rejected or not proven guilty, which is the null hypothesis is not rejected. Of course, if a journalist covers a trial, they are not forced to make this binary decision, but can describe the gray zone, how much evidence is there in favor of the defendant and how much is there to think that person is really guilty. Such an approach in most settings may be very helpful for scientists as well. Another issue is that the word significant is ambiguous. In plain English, if you look into a dictionary, you find definitions such as relevant, important, worthy of attention. These are terms that describe the quality of an effect. When statisticians use the word significant, they mean something entirely different. They mean that the p-value you calculated is smaller than your pre-specified statistical alpha, and therefore the null hypothesis is rejected. As I will show you in some of the following slides, a relevant effect and an effect with a small p-value are not necessarily associated. Therefore, several um, statisticians now recommend that you avoid the word significant in scientific tests and rather say what you really want to say, that is an effect was relevant, important, or that an effect had a small p-value. If you must say, and then report the p-value, of course, if you must say, significant and mean statistically, say statistically significant, to avoid confusion of the plain English meaning of the word. Very often in a statistical, in a paper, you see one asterisk on one data point, two on another, three on yet another data point. What does that mean? Obviously for the rejection of the null hypothesis, whether the p-value is 0 0.04 or it's 0 0.0004 is the same thing. The null hypothesis is rejected in both cases. Nonetheless, a difference in probability exists. And this is much better reflected in the distance of the end of the confidence interval from the null hypothesis. In clinical studies published in major journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet, that has long become the standard of reporting that you always report on effect size with its confidence interval. Something you don't see very often yet in the experimental life sciences. What you may also notice is if an investigator found an effect that had numerically an interesting magnitude of possible biological relevance, but has had a p-value somewhere between 0.05 and 0.1. And then you see all kinds of fancy wording, such as almost significant, trend for statistical significance, and all kinds of things like that. Well, on the one hand, this wording reflects the probability is a grayscale. However, it misses the point that statistical significance is all about making a crisp binary decision. Do I accept the statistical null hypothesis or do I reject it? Interestingly, similarly fancy wording 
is not found if the p-value is slightly below 0.05, if it's 0.049, people no longer question, is that meaningful? They say, yeah, I got it. It's a low p-value. My hypothesis was true. Well, neither is correct. And this article quoted here by Gibbs and Gibbs um, lists about 50 types of wording to describe p-values that were above 0.05, but the investigator liked to believe that the null hypothesis should be rejected. Now let's switch gears a little bit and let me take a sip of tea. If a p-value reports on probabilities, it of course implies that your conclusion may sometimes be wrong. And this is mostly classified in type one and type two errors. A type one error means you analyze your sample of data and conclude there is an effect, although none exists in the underlying population. You could say that's a false positive. On the other hand, a type two error means that you analyze a sample of data and conclude there is no effect if in reality it exists in the underlying population. To illustrate that in a way that you will never again forget, let me show you this cartoon. If this doctor tells this patient you're pregnant, that's a false positive or a real miracle. On the other hand, if this doctor tells her patient you're not pregnant, that most likely is a false miracle. False negatives are likely to occur in low power studies. As I already said, a p value reports the probability of seeing an effect as large as you observe or larger if the two samples came from populations with the same mean or median. In contrast to common perception, the p value does not tell us the probability that the observation is false. It lies in the mathematical nature of probability statements that they cannot be reversed. The other big misconception on p-values is that they are often seen as telling you something about whether the effect you observed is real or not. Well, in any given data set, there is a fixed mathematical relationship between effect size, variability, sample size, and the p-value. If you change one, the others will change as well. Thus, a p-value doesn't tell you something about the effect size. It tells you something about the interaction between effect size, variability, and sample size. Let me illustrate that by a couple of fake examples. So I just assumed here a value of 0.97 and a value of 1.03. And then I systematically subtracted 0.01 and 0.02 and added 0.01 and added 0.02 and did this in both groups. So what are we dealing with? It's a small sample size, only n is 5. The difference between the two groups is also small. That is about 5%. Variability is very low. It's about 1 to 2% for the standard deviation. I must say, in almost 40 years of experience in science, I've never come across any type of parameter that consistency, consistently has an SD of about only 1 to 2%. Nonetheless, with these assumptions, I get a very, very small p-value, even if the effect size most likely is not of any biological relevance. <clears throat> Let's take this a step further. I now did not add or subtract 0 .1, 0 0.01 and 0 0.02, but I subtracted 0.1 and 0.11 and added these numbers in both groups. So the sample size is still small, 
The effect has, of course, stayed the same. And now variability is about 10%. That's still small in most models. But under these assumptions, I now get a p-value of 0.39. Let's take it one step further. If I take this very same example, but enter every single value five times into the database, generating a sample size of 25 in each group, still, I have a very, very small effect. I have a low variability, but with a big sample size, I suddenly have a p-value that's back to less than 0.05. In other words, if you look at these three examples, with a really small effect size, a change by about 5%, minor changes in variability turn a p-value of 0.0003 to 0.3, but increasing the sample size brings it down to 0.03. However, the effect says the difference between the group stays just the same. So the question whether the treatment works or not becomes irrelevant because even if statistically significant, we're talking about an effect of 5%, which in most biological systems is irrelevant. You can play the same game. And here I just systematically added 0.5 to each value in the treated group. And again, with low variability, I get a very low p-value, but with a normal variability with an SD of let's say 30%, I get a much higher p-value. In this case, Anything with a change by about 50% or the difference of 50% most likely is biologically relevant. But if you cannot reject the null hypothesis here, probably what you're looking at is an inconclusive study, but not a data set telling you there is no difference. If something numerically changes by 50%, concluding there is no difference doesn't make sense which is basically the concept of absence of proof, which you see here, is not the same thing as proof of absence. An interesting trick is that if you make efforts to reduce variability because you're limited to a certain sample size, you may increase confidence in your data because variability goes down, that in itself, based on the fixed mathematical relationship, will change your p-value for the same effect size. A few years ago, there was a big editorial in Nature on this topic by Amrain, um, which was co-signed by more than 800 leading statisticians from all over the world. And in the paper, he shows this example. You have two hypothetical studies. This would be the zero effect line. And both studies have exactly the same observed effect. In one case with low variability, so the p-value would be low. And in the other case with a greater variability, so the p-value is high. These investigators would probably describe their study as, we found an effect. If these investigators found this, they should say we were unable to reject the null hypothesis. But they should not say we found no effect, because this effect is most likely biologically or clinically relevant. And if someone reviews those studies, the review should not conclude Oh, there, whether this effect exists is controversial. No, it's not controversial at all. Both studies find exactly the same thing. But with the observed variability, it had a low p-value in one and a high p-value in the other study. Let's switch gears again. 
If you think about the simple situation, you compare two groups. There are basically four types of statistical tests people apply. It can, if you um, assume that the data exhibit a normal distribution, you apply a parametric test. And if you do not make that assumption, you apply a non-parametric test. And the says can be done with unpaired or paired version resulting in an unpaired t-test, a paired t-test, a Mann-Whitney or Wilcoxon matched pair test. Well, let's see how that pans out based on real data. And the data I'm gonna show you now are data one of my PhD students generated in an experiment, Katerina Okeke from Greece. She incubated cells with a beta receptor agonist, isoprenaline, and measured cyclic GMP formation in her cells. Some of the cells were under control conditions, and on the same day, there were cells that had been pre-treated with something for 24 hours. As you can see here, she did eight experiments, and in every single of the eight experiments, the pre-treated cells had a smaller cyclic AMP response. But you also see that the control response exhibited a huge variability between days. If you had asked me at the level of study design, which statistical test should I use? I may have had certain preferences. Probably would have gone for a pad test of some type. But if you had said, no, I don't want to run an unpaired test, I do assume normal distribution, I do not assume normal distribution, I would have said, yeah, that's also an absolutely fair approach. Nonetheless, and you could say, well, because this doesn't look like a normal distribution, I do analysis on a log scale. Or I assume what's called a one sample t-test where in every single experiment, I will look at this ratio and then see whether that ratio deviates from unity. All 10 options are perfectly legitimate options. Nonetheless, what you see here is p-values for the 10 statistical tests range from 0.001 to 0.0406. Well, in this case, because the effect is so consistent, eight out of eight experiments show a decrease, that they're all are less than 0.05. But that's rare. In most cases, at least one or two show something different. Well, What I want to use this example for is not saying, well, once you've seen your data, with this, you can now pick one test that gives you the p-value you like. That would be fraud. If you get caught with fraud, you may get fired for a good reason. However, it also tells you if each of these options in principle is a legitimate options, whether you conclude that a certain effect has low p-value or not, depends to, to a large degree on the choice you made in the design phase, whether to which test to use. And that's what makes it so relevant that you pre-specify also your statistical analysis strategy before you do the experiment. But if your p-value is high, what does that not significant mean? As I told you already, as in a criminal court of law, no statistical test can prove the null hypothesis. On the other hand, if the null hypothesis was not rejected, it means just that. And there are multiple, not mutually exclusive explanations for that. There may be no difference, and that's how it's most often interpreted. But it could also be that 
there is a difference, but the effect size was too small or the, uh, or the sample size too small or the variability too large to detect it. And of course, there always is the possibility that you have a type two error. Now, in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the concept of the false discovery rate. Even if everything has been done by the book, you did anything possible to reduce bias. A statistically significant finding may not be true. This poor robustness, even of miraculously appropriately designed studies, was already predicted in 2005 by John Ioannidis. The underlying concept was later termed the false discovery rate by David Colcoon, who, um, from whom I showed you a quote earlier. And in later work, he referred to it as the false positive rate. Let me explain to you what that means. Many of you will be familiar with the positive predictive value. That is the probability that a real effect exists if a statistically significant result has been obtained. The false discovery is exactly the opposite of that. It is That is, the probability that a real effect does not exist if a statistically significant result has been obtained. So they are flip sides of the same coin. Let me show you an example from David Kulkun to do this based on real data. This is from a screening setting for some disease, in this case, for a mild cognitive impairment as it occurs in early stages of Alzheimer's disease. We know that the true prevalence in the population of this is about 1%. And we now have a screening test at hands, and these are real data, that has a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 95% pretty good values for a screening test. So if 10,000 people are tested with this prevalence, 1% should have the conditions, which is about 100 people. And with this sensitive, 80 of them are detected as positive. And these are true positive tests. 20 will not be detected. These are false negatives. However, the remaining 99% do not have more false um, early Alzheimer's. At a specificity of 0 0.95, 95 are detected as negative, true negative, but 5% will be positive, false positives. In this case, that is 495, which is much more than the 80 here. So in this specific example, 495 out of 575, are falsely detected as positives, which is a false discovery rate of 86%. Now let's take this to our experiments. Let's assume a thousand scientists run a study. And realistically, 10% will have, let's assume a correct hypothesis. And they all run a study with a power of 80%, frankly, extremely over-optimistic. And they all accept the version of five. So in theory, 10% should be correct. 80 will be recognized as true positives. On the other hand, at a significant level of 0 0.05, 5% 5 will, just based on chance alone, be positives. So 45 out of total of 125 low p-value studies are wrong, still 36%. So in his um, 2005 paper, John Ioannidis went through a number of variations of this as example. This is the power of a study. This is the ratio between true, not true relationships, which is the prior probability. And he introduced a bias factor. If your study is really powered for 80% and there's a 50-50 chance it's true and your bias is very small, 
you still, your positive predictive value is only 85%. So 15% of outcomes will be false positives. But if you look at something more realistically, let's say the studies are powered at only 20%, and it's a surprising finding that had a prior probability of only one in five. And there is quite some bias. Suddenly, your positive predictive value is only 0.17, which means 83% will give you a low p-value despite your conclusion being wrong. So what drives that? The big thing here is low prior probability. How unexpected is this exciting finding? And that is why many guidelines in the field ask that you discriminate between exploratory and confirmatory studies. Anything that's not the pre-specified primary endpoint by definition has a lower prior probability and therefore a high false discovery rate. Other factors are a high chosen alpha and low power based on small effect size, small sample size, and your alpha. Again, in the words of David Colcoon, a p-value around 0.5 means nothing more than worth another look. If you want to avoid making a fool of yourself very often, do not regard anything greater than p less than 0.001 as demonstration that you've truly discovered something. So in the last two slides, I want to talk about p-hacking. p-hacking is any undisclosed change in experimental or analysis strategy after initial results have been seen. That could be a post hoc change of sample size, a change in the parameter to be mostly analyzed and reported, a post hoc decision for data normalization, a post hoc decision for an alternative statistical test, or outlier removal driven by your target p value. All of these induce bias for finding a difference even if it's not there in reality, but even if it exists in reality for an exaggerated effect size. So p-hacking markedly aggravates the risk for misleading p-values. I showed you this example previously. So if you post hoc would choose one of these tests, ran all 10, that would be p-hacking. So as my final slide, here is also a picture of David Kalkun. And the quote I already showed you, the function of significance tests is to prevent you from making a fool of yourself and not to make unpublishable results publishable. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to address any questions you may have. Well, uh, thank you, Martin. Um, I'm taking over here for uh, for Kim. Um, certainly, very interesting and, and nice presentation. Uh, really liked the uh, legal analogies and and uh, that you used to make that really clear. So um, the floor is open. Anybody has a question? Please shout them out. If not, maybe I'll start with one. Um, so you said earlier uh, regarding uh, biases that, that certain biases also add up. And um, it's then always the question sort of like, okay, what is a small bias? What is a strong bias here? If you think about, for instance, transgenic animals that you cannot really blind, uh, um, uh, how would... Uh, how would you, what would you say is sort of like a stronger bias? Um, and uh, what does it actually mean? Sort of like if there's a bias you can't avoid, does it automatically mean that you cannot use the p-value at all? Or is there a rule of thumb? How would you go okay. about it? Okay, yeah. Um, first of all, I don't think there's a rule of thumb that is meaningful. I think what you can say in general, any study really designed to test a hypothesis 
should implement all feasible steps to reduce biases. And even if it's not designed to test a null hypothesis, the more you reduce your biases, the better the technical quality of your study. Overall, you can think about it this way. Probably a study may have a hundred different biases, many of them you don't even realize. Whether they are meaningful or relevant depends if the effect you're chasing is large and the impact of the bias is limited. It probably doesn't make a difference. Maybe the true effect size is 90 and you find 100, big deal. But if the effect size you're changing and in some biological systems that may be relevant is small, the relative contribution of the biases becomes much larger. Um, let's say um, something where a small effect size is relevant, an example from clinical medicine. We know from huge outcome study with thousands of participants that if you can lower blood pressure by two millimeters of mercury at the population mean or the group mean of thousands of patients, that already has an impact on the number of strokes. However, any given measurement of blood pressure has a variability of plus minus 10. Mm -hmm. And if there is even a minor bias in your study design, that may already either cancel out the two millimeters of real difference or pretend there are two millimeters of difference if in reality it doesn't exist. For instance, because somehow study participants for a new anti sensitive drug could tell, hey, I'm on the active treatment group. Let me give you one more example from my own personal experience. I was fortunate enough back in early 21. I was in no particularly risk group. We had the pandemic and vaccines were just being rolled out. So not being in a risk group, my most likely chance to get my vaccine would probably have been in May or June of 21. But I was given the possibility to participate as volunteer in a phase three study for one of those vaccines. And a lot of people, and so our entire medical school was invited to participate. And so sure enough, in the coffee room, we were saying, hey, did you have side effects? And those who had side effects said, yes, I got real treatment. I'm protected now. And those who didn't have side effects said, oh, shit, I probably got placebo. Now, that may sound innocent, but think about the consequences. Those who thought they were now protected most likely were a little less stringent on risk avoiding for contacts, for exposure. Those who thought, hey, I only got placebo, I'm still unprotected, may have been a little more inclined to avoid contacts. So your placebo group probably had fewer contacts and your active treatment group had more contacts. Now that can screw up the entire analysis how effective the vaccine works. And indeed, the vaccine that were our participant trial at the end of the day was never approved because it had a fairly high placebo rate. Yeah. Um, um, let me let me follow up with with a, a different question now, sort of like to, to flip this because uh, I'm, I'm actually counseling groups uh, um, um, on their innovative design and and and, and experiments um, that uh, have a limited budget, for instance, and due to this, they um, they um, need to. Um, work with what they have, which is, for instance, like a small sample size. So they, they cannot have, for instance, more than, than four samples 
but predict uh, um, a sort of like a, a large uh, effect um, based on, on previous data, especially if, um, if, if you have two patient groups that you can contrast really well, sort of one has the disease, one doesn't have the disease. Um, so um, where is sort of the, the, the point where you would say is uh, um, a sample size that you can still justify to uh, um, have um, under these settings where you expect a large effect um or, or would you all say this is um there's still a chance that you include false positives and could go to a different yeah. site so uh, okay firstly there always is a chance p values are about probabilities second ideally a hypothesis testing study should be based on formal sample size power calculations however while that is relatively easy in clinical medicine, where you typically know, oh, if blood pressure goes down by this, that's the effects as you're, you, you want to look at. In experimental biology, the more innovative my research is, the less I have existing data to do a meaningful sample size calculation. Because for that, you don't need the observed effect size in your pilot study or the observed variability in your pilot study, you need the real variability in the underlying populations, which needs you must have hundreds of measurements already, which innovative research you never have. And it's not about the effects as you observe, but sample size calculations should be based on the smallest effect size you consider biologically relevant. And if my primary outcome parameter, let's say, is mRNA expression of a certain enzyme, what is relevant? In most cases, I have no clue. For the simple reason, I don't even know how much mRNA translates into how much protein, how much protein is relevant, and so forth. Bottom line is, in most settings we do in experimental research, we will be restricted to exploratory research for the simple reason we don't have the existing database to do a meaningful sample size calculation. And that's just the way it is. But I have one piece of good news. I told you about this fixed mathematical relationship. And this relationship implies if you can reduce variability by 50%, Mathematically, that's the same thing as increasing sample size fourfold. Or more generally speaking, if your variability goes down by a factor X, that's the mathematical equivalent of sample size going up by a factor X squared. So if there is anything you can do in your work to reduce variability, for instance, by multiple technical replicates, or by um, thinking about how you can most precisely measure something that does miracles for your statistical power. So that's the good news. There's, there's, this is the only thing we can control. We cannot control what's the real effect is because that's reality. That's not under our control. Sample size, we cannot work with a lot because of restraints in the real world. But the only factor from this equation on which we have an influence is variability. I see that Helena also had a comment or question. Helena, please. Hello. Thank you very much for your informative and exciting presentation. I would like to ask a question that I've been asking myself for a while about significance. If I compare, for example, the number of ibuprofen prescriptions, for example, over 10 years, and see an increase in prescriptions. Why do I need a test for statistical significance when the data have been collected and are factual? Okay, good point. Um, yes, I can share. The, um, I don't know much now about the details of your project, but hey, it sounds to me like you don't need statistics on that. 
generally, the closer your sample comes to the population, for instance, if you have a huge database of that covers 90% of all people in your country, yeah. you don't need statistics anymore because your sample size already is almost the entire population. Um, the relevant question always is, is the effect I observe of biological or clinical relevance. The question whether it has a low p-value is completely secondary to that. If yeah. the effect says you observe is not of biologically or clinical relevance, who cares what the p-value is? It only becomes relevant once you have an effect, a numeric effect that looks relevant, and then you can ask the question, hey, is that any fact that What's the probability that this could have occurred based on chance alone? Okay. But if the effect by itself is not of a relevant magnitude, the whole question whether it has a low or high p-value is irrelevant because it's an irrelevant effect. Who cares about the p-value? Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure. Any other comment or question? Oh, I see a question in the chat from Kim. Um, so she wrote the question of Helena, does that mean that your research question should also only be about the population of your country? So not explanation to the population of the world. Good point, Kim. Um, healthcare systems in different countries are different based on, let's say, obesity rates in California are less than in Texas. And for that reason, even if you have health data on every single Californian, that may have, for certain diseases, limited rele uh, relevance for those who um, live in Texas. But that's a question that cannot be addressed by any statistician. That's a question only the expert in this area can decide. For statisticians, it doesn't make any difference whether you look at the, st the stability of a bridge or the growth of a cancer cell. They're all the same. But for those working on the cancer cell or on the stability of a bridge, these are really different questions, and you cannot extrapolate from one to the other. Understood, thanks. Any other comments or questions? Ooh, even. Helena? Thank you. So just back to my question again. So when I ask myself whether an increase over time is significant or not, I should not look at the P-level, but answer the question for myself, whatever it is sufficient for an answer if, if the increase is there or not, or what do you it, think? It, it depends what your real pre-study question was. If you want to say, hey, in my country, the use of ibuprofen went up from um, 14 defined daily doses per person per year to 25. Hey, from 14 to 25, that's a big difference. That probably is relevant if you find something like that. And whether it occurs based on chance alone here is something that probably statistics are not good at looking at because, for instance, a lot of people take ibuprofen in the context of a common cold. And if you had a very heavy common cold season in one year and a very light season in the next, that may explain why in one year it's high, in one year usage is low. And so there is an extra variable that biases your study. In one one year you had a high rate of common cold and one year you had a low rate. And that's a bias that's inherently part of your investigation. 
nothing that you could do anything about. That's why in a study like that, you probably would look at multiple years and look at the overall time course. Um, but that, so there are in many fields of research, obvious variables you cannot control. And they may already be the explanation of your finding. I mean, we saw, if you ask, um, let's go back to the COVID pandemic. During the COVID pandemic, death rates from influenza globally went down. And you can probably calculate a p-value for that. But what does the p-value tell you? That says it's more than based on chance alone. Yeah, big deal. If everybody stayed at home, if everybody wore masks, then of course, influenza also goes down. So whether that has a p low p-value or not is not really relevant. Thank you very much for your explanation. Renee, you had another comment or question? Yeah, um, that just came to mind because uh, some years ago uh, there was this the concept uh, in the same uh, discussion came about about the Bayesian uh, um, statistics or Bayesian uh, experimental design. And if you look at these, they are sort of really complicated. A, how can they help? And is that something like a researcher can really do by themselves or do you need a biostatistician mm -hmm. okay. to set up an experiment? Yeah. So many professional card carrying statisticians will tell you Bayesian statistics is better than classic ones. However, Bayesian statistics is really complex and you need quite some time to understand it and learn how to use it. If your research involves over the next 10 years, a lot of statistical analysis, it may be worthwhile getting that type of training. For the majority of us who are more interested in the biology than in the statistics, I would be, I think the world becomes already a much better place if some of the fundamental concepts are touched in today's webinar were better understood and not p-values thrown all over the place in studies with a lot of conscious or unconscious biases. So I'm a pragmatic guy. Yes, Bayesian may have advantages. It probably has, but um, it's, so, if it's so complicated that 99% of all biologists don't use it it doesn't really make research better. But if I think the principles I lined out today are something that are easy to understand and easy to apply in your project. And the impact on overall reproducibility, if that happens, probably is bigger than a handful of people on the planet switching to, switching to Bayesian. That's encouraging. <laughs> Are there any further questions for Martin? Now is your chance. Maybe everyone's still uh, digesting your uh, uh, powerful message, Martin. Um, we're also uh, one minute away from five o'clock, so I think it's a good moment to then uh, thank you for uh, this great lecture and the discussion. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll see you again uh, in another webinar. And we hope to see uh, all the participants in any case again in two weeks when we have uh, the next EQIP webinar coming up. Uh, the recording will be available on our LinkedIn page very soon. Uh, and um, yeah, if there are no further comments, then I wish you all a very nice evening and until next time. Yeah, bye-bye. May the be with you. Thanks everyone.